Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining our session with Lily Goat. Lily Goat is a uh, high school student, one of our youth interns from last year, and she is also one of the organizers for this year. So we've been working with Lily and several others since January planning the program. Some of you may know Lily because she interviewed you. <laughs> but other than that, you know, those who have been going on Wednesdays will get a chance to meet with Lily. That's her day. She's both at the SMLI farm as well as the preserve on that day. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Lily. Go ahead, Lily. Hi, my name is Lily. I'm going to be senior this fall and I am very into birds and animals in general and quarantine just escalated that even more. So it's been a great year where I learned a lot, mostly through the summer program in Audubon. And I'd really like to share this like magical world that I only recently really discovered with everyone. And I would also like to make this presentation a little more of a conversation than a lecture. So if anyone has any questions or things they would want to discuss or anything really, please let me know because I love talking about birds and I wanna make sure that everyone here is getting something out of it. Um, I can't share my screen. Uh, could you try again? Sorry. Okay. Um, one second. Share desk. Okay, yeah, thank you. Share. Present. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, I can see yeah, it. I see it. Okay, great. So I will be presenting on bird identification. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, any specific things you would like to talk about, please let me know. You could use the raise hand feature or unmute because I don't have the chat open, but I will check the chat um, later. So just starting off, could anyone identify what this bird is? Just as an introduction to see where everyone is. A blue jay? A blue jay. Yes. And how about this one? We still have the blue jay. Oh. Oh, now now we do. Okay. okay. Cardinal. That's a cardinal. And how about this one? If it's low, it's probably um, a raven. Grackle. Close. What was that? Grackle. Yes, my favorite bird. I include them in every bird thing I do. And how about this one, which is something you may have seen before, but it looks kind of strange, and you might not know the name for it. A heron? Close. No. Oh. Styles. Um, this is a double crested cormorant. It's a fun, funny name. Cormorant. And it's fun to say. But anyway, so here's just a disclaimer. I'm not going to be going over every bird. It would take forever and it would get really boring and people would not learn anything. But please ask questions if you have any. So why should we identify birds? The, a big reason is citizen science. For example, you could use the apps eBird and iNaturalist to record your observations into a database that tracks populations and helps scientists all over the globe with studying different animals and ecosystems. Um, we also appreciate biodiversity by learning about all these different birds. When I first started getting really into birds, I didn't even know that we had as many species as we do here, it's incredible. Um, also, a great thing about identifying birds is that you could recognize native birds versus non-native birds versus invasive birds. So a non-native bird would be like the green parrots that I'm not sure if anyone has seen. They're not necessarily invasive because they're not damaging to other birds. They just nest in like telephone pole type areas. So they're not really 
harmful. They're just not native. And then there are invasive birds like the house sparrow, which proliferate all over and take over the habitats of other birds. Another reason is knowing what is attracted to our gardens. If you see a bird in your garden and you know that it started coming more because you planted something, you should know what that bird is because it's interesting. And also it's just fun. Bird watching is fun for some people, <laughs> but it's fun. Um, so here are some ways to identify birds. Oh wait, just going back. Does anyone have any other ideas for why we should identify birds? I want to know what my cat just ate. That is a good one. <laughs> Raju, my goodness. No, that's actually a, a thing that I've, <laughs> I'm part of like some bird identifying groups and people send pictures of birds and like, is this a bad thing that my bird, that my cat killed this one? <laughs> so people want to know, it's, that is actually a reason that people do. There's also um, like, I know for hunting, you want to make sure that what you're hunting is something that's legal to hunt, um, especially with ducks. And some ways we identify birds are, first of all, my favorite way is through Merlin Bird ID. It's this amazing app that's connected to eBird, which is also connected to Cornell. Through it, you could record sounds and take pictures mm -hmm. and just even describe the bird and it'll identify it for you. It's amazing. Um, you could also record observations, just in general, write them down, take note of them, write them on your phone, uh, the bird's shape or color, you could sketch it. You should also note the habitat and the behavior. Certain birds are only going, are going to be in very specific places, like, for example, plovers at the beach and pigeons in more urban areas. There are also amazing bird books that I would definitely recommend, like the Sibley mm. Guides, the Warbler Guide, mm -hmm. the Audubon Field and the Audubon Field Guides. You could also take photos or record sounds, which might be more difficult, and overall just practice. So I was going to go like bird species by family, but instead I'm going to start mm -hmm. by highlighting the important, um, the most common and important ones that I think most people um, should now know about after this, hopefully. So starting with sparrows, this is the song sparrow. It is one of the most, according to the bird description, it is one of the most common and widespread sparrows in North America. It's fairly large compared to other sparrows with a large rounded tail. It's overall coarsely patterned with gray and brown, usually with more reddish brown wings and tail. Look especially for thick brown streaks on the underparts over here and a broad dark mustache stripe. So with these guys, they're very, very common. They come to feeders, they'll be in fields. I've seen them at the Science Museum many times and they make a very familiar sound that I can't replicate because <laughs> it sounds a little off when I do it, but I will show it after if anyone wants to hear. The next bird is the white-throated sparrow. It's another similar looking bird, except it has this signature white throat over here. It's described as a large, again, compared to other sparrows, long-tailed sparrow. It usually has this like bold head pattern of these black and white and this little yellow part over here and the contrasting white throat. There are two morphs with different head colors, white striped and tan striped. Um, both morphs show a yellow patch in front of the eye. Morphs are just like simply two different plumage or color or shape types, but it is more obvious on white striped birds. So for example, like this is very prominent mm -hmm. on this bird. They also have this gray cone-shaped bill, which these guys have more of, it's still gray, but it's a little more tannish versus this, which is very silvery. And then just gonna skip through these. 
Oh, and then there's this one, which is actually not closely related to our other sparrows, but this is the one you're probably most likely Lily, we lost your sound. Huge reason why our bluebird population has been going down because they take over their nests and kill the baby bird. So here's another family. Out of these, there are only two that hopefully you would recognize. The first one is the Northern Mockingbird. These guys are very common. A great way for identifying them is a signature white stripe when they're flying. You'll see like these fe white feathers on the tail that really contrasts with these darker gray feathers. They also have this yellowish whitish eye with a large pupil. Um, if you get really close, you could see these sort of whiskers I feel like are a little bit more prominent on them than other birds. I'm not completely sure, but I know when I look at mockingbirds, they always seem to have more prominent ones. Um, yeah, the, in flight, it becomes much flashier with large white patches on the black wings and tail. When you, That's a good way to identify them when you see them flying. They're found in a variety of habitats with bushes and trees from neighborhoods to desert scrub and old pastures. The reason they're called mobbing, mockingbirds is because they like to mimic sounds that they hear, such as other bird sounds, car alarms, slamming doors, and other noises in its song. And because they mimic other animals, that makes it very difficult to identify them by their song. So what I do and what eBird recommends is to listen for a phrase repeated five to seven times before switching to the next set of notes. This has helped a lot for me in identifying mockingbirds. If you can't see them, if you just hear this strange call that you can't put your finger on and it repeats that much, it's probably a mockingbird. Are there any questions so far at this point? Mockingbirds, what do they eat? I mean, oh, yeah. I guess. Um, insects, mostly. So I'm not seeing, so I wouldn't see them for the seed. They would not necessarily be coming for the seed. They'd be coming for the insects. So seeing Most them earlier in the season, why? Yes, I'm pretty sure they're omni om omnivorous, but I've only seen them going for insects. Any other questions? Do you know what the seed eating birds eat early in the season when there are no seeds or not many in spring? For a example. lot of them, I know a lot of them migrate, which is why there's that huge migration in the fall, close, closer to the winter. So they go to areas where there are more seeds, same with a lot of the insect eaters. Otherwise, they ha start to rely a lot on bird feeders because in, if this was like a long time ago, there would be a lot more seeds or acorns and other things in winter, but because there's so much development here, they don't really have that access to that in the winter, which is why a lot of people put out bird feeders once it gets cold and the seeds start going out. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay. The next bird is similar to the mockingbird in both appearance and Genetics, it's called the gray catbird. And these ones are very, very easy to identify by their call because they make a meowing sound. Um, if I had to do an, imp an impression, it would be like, ah! Ah! sort of. And it sounds very cat-like. They also look almost similar to mockingbirds in their body type, but they're this more of this bluish smooth gray body without all the different white bits. They also have this chestnut colored tail, which doesn't really show here. They also have this little black cap and they're about the size of a robin, but a little smaller. Let me skip this one. 
So our thrushes, starting with the American Robin. I'm sure everyone has seen one of these before, but might not have known what it's called. So the American Robin is this pretty large songbird that has this signature reddish, orangish um, belly, while the rest of it is gray or black. When they're young, they actually, it's less orange over here, it's more stripy, but you could still tell that it's a robin because they have, they're a similar size and they, everything else looks very similar other than the streakiness over here. These guys are very much worm eaters. You might see them tapping on the ground, trying to imitate rain to get the worms come up so they could eat them. And it's very entertaining to watch a robin finally catch a worm and then just start bouncing around with it and flying away. This is the Eastern Bluebird. You're probably not going to see these because they're in decline because of the house sparrow. And here's a bird that you've probably also seen before. It was the first one in the presentation. It's pretty recognizable. It's the Blue Jay. It has a very striking look that isn't shared by many other birds, really. And a great way to tell that there's a blue jay nearby, if you can't see the blue, is listen for this almost, it's almost like nails on a chalkboard, but like more, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, ah! and it repeats very loudly. And they do that sometimes whenever and sometimes as an alarm to other blue jays. These guys will eat seeds. They're fairly general. They don't have super, super specific diets. The next ones are, is, are, are crows. You don't have to pay attention to the differences between these. They're pretty difficult to tell apart. But these are our crows. They're large, but they're not super big, unlike a raven, which is this big. Um, you might have seen a raven before. They're huge. And seeing them is interesting, but crows small, ravens big. Also, they have different bill shapes. Star warblers, like these are warblers. They usually pass here as migrants. I know for sure that yellow warblers and red starts stay here through the summer, but I'm not sure about the others. They are all very small, high pitched sounding birds but they can get very difficult to identify. So if you see a very small bird that has bright colors, it's probably some sort of warbler, or in the fall, it might not have bright colors, but they all have this pretty signature shape. Next is my favorite family of birds, starting with the common grapple. Um, these are my favorite birds, like I said before, they are identifiable by their long black bodies and their bright yellow eye. They also have this shiny gloss-like appearance on their feathers that makes them appear very shiny and all different colors. So when they're in the dark, they'll look like pure black with a yellow eye. And when they're in the light, they'll be blue or purple or green or brown. Like over here, you could see some of the purples. They're very beautiful. And they're also pretty general with what they eat. I've seen them chasing crows before trying to get what they're eating. They go to feeders a lot. And they come here early spring through summer. The next bird that you've probably seen before in this family is the red-winged blackbird. And they also, similar to the blue jays, have a very recognizable call. It's almost mechanical. I don't, again, I'm not 100% sure how to describe it, but I'll show them later. It, when the males call, they puff up all their feathers and especially their little red shoulders and show them off, which is very cute. 
And the female looks almost sparrow-like, but she's a lot bigger than sparrows with bigger claws and the more of a longer, sharper bill than you would expect of most sparrows. They, I've seen them here for almost year round, but I'm not sure if they are 100% here year round. Um, the next ones, these are other birds you might have seen in this family. It's a cowbird. Here are ducks, geese, and swans. Any questions at this point? Any questions or any comments? Okay, so the next bird is this duck, which is all over everywhere called the mallard. And the males have this green head with the yellow bill and the females are much more plain looking. And they are commonly seen with other mallards at ponds. One even flew to my house to get to my theater. They're very general. They'll eat a lot of stuff. Don't feed them bread though, it's not good for them. Why are they so common and everywhere, uh, Lily? I I'm guessing it's because they're such generalists and it seems like they're fairly comfortable around people. Like, they seem to just like, they, they'll eat grass, they'll eat bread, they'll eat people's leftover McDonald's. And I'm not sure if it has anything to do with how they've raised their babies, but they're just everywhere. Yeah, I've seen them. It's still them came all the way to my feeder from the pond that's a few blocks from my house. Strange. <laughs> Another bird is the Canada goose. These are also very recognizable. They have this white chin strap and they're very large and they honk a lot. They, in spring, they're very, very, very protective of their young. So would definitely recommend keeping your space from them in spring because they can be very aggressive. In the winter, not as much or any, any other time really, but just don't approach them in general because they're wildlife. Um, yeah, they're found around ponds, marshes, pretty much in bodies of water in general. And they also seem to be pretty general in what they eat. The next bird is the mute swan. They are our only swan and they're actually not native to here. And they're very, very beautiful, but they also can be really aggressive. And unlike the Canada geese, they will be aggressive even if it's not like spring. So as pretty as swans are, please keep your distance. You could recognize them by their S-shaped neck, this um, little bump over there and the orange bill. And of course, like the all white colors. Younger ones will look a lot grayer and will have a duller bill, but they're still mute swans as long as they have that S-shaped neck. Uh, skipping that, skipping that. Birds of prey. We have a lot of them on Long Island and I did not know that. So a very recognizable one that's even in the city is the peregrine falcon, which is this really cool looking and strong bird that's I think about twice the size of a pigeon. It's 
a falcon and it hunts small birds in flight. Like you could sometimes see them circling around starlings. And they're fairly common. They also are recognizable by this very distinctive black mask and the yellow around their eye. There's another bird of prey that we've might you've might have you've might have seen, especially during the summer. These are the osprey. They're these pretty large birds of prey, and they hunt fish. They could all um, a lot of times when you see those really high up boxes near the beach or near water in general, usually near the ocean with a ton of sticks in it, odds are it's one of these, or it's built for one of these. And they have a huge migration from South America to here. They're pretty widespread and they're, they started making a comeback since the use of DDT has declined. And now they're pretty common. You might, you'll probably see them if you go to the beach in summer. Just gonna keep this. Um, so what you might be hearing that you might think is an owl, because I know they make a similar like who sound is a morning dove. And morning doves make that sound that's like, Ooh, 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 ooh. And although it sounds like an owl, they are not owls. Um, they're very, they're native. They're very fun to look at and they eat seeds, a lot of seeds. They're usually ground feeders. So if you have a feeder and there's seeds on the ground, odds are there will be some morning doves looking there if they find the feeder. When they fly, they also make a do -do 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 sound. And yeah, they're recognizable by their peach, dull peach colored body and these like beige wings with the black spots on them. Unlike, although they look like pigeons, they, you can tell the difference by their patterns and sounds that they make. This is the bird from the beginning, the double crested cormorant. They're similar to all the osprey, they're also fish eaters. I've seen these all, all year round and they can dive really far underwater. So you might see them poking out of the water, just their neck and their head. They also have this very, if it is with closer a picture, you could see that the eye is very brightly colored. And that's another way to distinguish them from other birds like herons. And here's another bird that you might see, which is a Northern flicker. And another common bird that I wanted to highlight is the black cap chickadee. These make a sound that's like, ooh, 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 ooh. and they are also fairly common around here. They're very small and a great way to recognize them is through the pattern on their face, which is this almost Oreo-like, but if like the cookie started shrinking near that part and the rest just was the Oreo cream. <laughs> that's how I see it. They also have these very small beady eyes, these really small cone-like bills, teeny feet, and they're very round. Once when I was doing bird banding, these are the, these fly into the nets quite a bit when we do bird banding. And they're, these beaks are very tiny, but they pinch really hard. So that's another way I remember them by, oh, they're the ones that have the tiny beaks, but they're really strong. Yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I would also like to share the European starling, which is another bird you might see, but it's not as, it's not native and they are definitely invasive. I just didn't add them in here because I was doing it by family, sorry. This is the European starling. They, similar to the house sparrow, they will make nests everywhere. They were brought here by someone who came to New York thinking 
that they were going to bring all these birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's plays to the United States. And that really did not end well because the European starlings ended up taking over. Good for the person that wanted to have more Shakespeare birds here, but definitely not good for other birds who are here because they take over food resources and nesting space. Yeah, they're some of them. So this one doesn't really have as distinguished spots, but some of them have very distinguished spots. Some of them are shiny, similar to a grackle, but they're smaller and they have those usually have bright yellow bills or these kind of more dull brownish ones with the spots. So yeah, I, I hope you learned something. If anyone wants to go over any specific bird groups, please, please let me know. What do we do to attract these birds to our yard, so to speak? Like you spoke of um, feeders, but. So I know for, I didn't include goldfinches in here. There are just so many birds. You can't include them all, but goldfinches, for example, are very big fans of purple coneflowers, which are a native plant that I know that we have in our gardens at Dodge and at SMLI, and I'm not sure about uh, the other ones, but we definitely grow those. And the goldfinches will go to those flowers and eat the seeds from them. So that's a good way if you're not looking to get a feeder, which people are actually advising against right now because there's this new bird disease spreading. So no feeders right now. Mm -hmm. So feeders are, um, so, yeah, as you said, we could definitely plant natives which would attract birds because of both the seeds of specific species as well as uh, um, insects that uh, harbor yes. the spaces. Um, so that's one, and, and then bird feeders, so you're recommending against bird feeders right now? Just because right now, I don't know if the situation has changed since I last checked up on it. I don't want to assume anything really and give the wrong information, but from what I last checked, there's been this disease going around the United States that's taking out especially grackles, blue jays, and cardinals. So certain bird groups are recommending against having bird feeders right now to prevent birds from coming together and congregating and spreading that disease to each other since, and potentially potentially to humans, which is the main concern. Any other questions or anything that you would want to go back to and look at since I went through the other birds fast to highlight the more important ones? Chai, well, any of you could always, like when you're at uh, SMLI on Wednesdays or reach out to uh, Lily, and if you want to get into bird identification, into birding, absolutely, it's a great time, uh, and we have a lot of resources. So thanks so much, Lily. Yes. Unless there, there's anybody with a question, we will thank Lily, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all at your uh, work sites this coming week. Thank you. Also, if anyone wants to listen to those Oh, thank you, Kathy. If anyone wants to listen to the bird calls that I mentioned, um, feel free to stay. I might just quickly show those. Okay, Desktop. okay thank, thank you. you. I'll stop recording now. Yeah. Um, so, song sparrow sound Merlin.